coming to everybody. Um, thank you. This is the Variety Masterclass. My name is Leslie Felperin. And uh, we're going to talk for a little while with Ms. Sarandon, just me and her, and then we'll throw it up into questions from the audience. Um, it's a masterclass, so I you know, really um, intrigued her to think of questions that are relevant to her career and to her skill as an actress and to also her role as, a, as an artist, as citizen of the world as well. So um, let's start just to warm up, a kind of standard opening salvo. Um, you studied acting, I understand, at university, but when did you always no, want to? I never to... studied acting. Oh, right, Miss Miss Nomer. I went That's to good four start. years of university, mm -hmm. uh, during which time I studied drama from more of a literature point of view. The college that I went to uh, focused uh, mostly on graduate students to act. Um, I never imagined myself acting. I just basically wanted to leave New Jersey, which was where I was born. <laughs> um, and I kind of fell into acting later. I married very young, a, gra a graduate student who became an actor very quickly. And at one point, um, they, um, someone asked him, he was doing regional theater, and someone asked him to audition for an agent, and he needed someone to do a scene with him, and I did the scene with him, and they asked to also represent me. And uh, we moved to New York in the fall, and in about... Seven days later, I had gotten the lead in a film, which was the first job I auditioned for, which just goes to show you how incredibly easy acting really is. And, um, and that film became a huge success. And from that point on, I kept working. And so I kind of learned as I was working. And that, that first part of the in, in Joe was it, was it, you know, what resonated in you? What, what, what made you think, yeah, this is what I want to do. I was right to... Um, in the very first day of shooting, it was a low-budget film. I think it was the first uh, real film. They had done porno films before this, I believe. <laughs> and it was a very, very low-budget film, which was uh, done by a first-time director who actually uh, legally was the cameraman on that film, a director called John Alvitson, who later went on to do the Rocky films and became quite famous. And the very first day of work, I had to freak out on a drug that was a very unspecific drug, but, um, and I had to trash the inside of a, a store. And I got in to do one take, taking everything off the shelves of the store. And, and I just thought that was so much fun. And um, I thought, well, this is, you know, I mean, I made no money. I was wearing my own clothes. I did my own makeup and hair and uh, pretty much researched and rewrote most of what I had to say. Um, but I didn't know any better. And uh, I thought, well, you know, it, it really was fun. And uh, Peter Boyle was on that film, and he helped me quite a bit. He was, um, I think, responsible for creating the character of Joe from a, uh, a character that he had created uh, at Second City, which is an improvisational group in Chicago. And we were very, very lucky to get him involved. And, um, and I thought, well, this is just hysterical, you know. And every single job I went up for after that I thought was funnier than the next. And I think that's probably why I kept getting work was that I, it took me about 10 years before I said, well, I guess I'm an actor. This is, I guess, what I do. And uh, meanwhile, I was just trying to pay back my school debts. Yeah. And um, anything that I got paid more than unemployment to me seemed like a lot of money. And I started also doing uh, commercials and theater during that time. And, uh, and so that, that's kind of an untraditional uh, approach that most acting schools are really upset when I explain that. Um, <laughs> but my daughter's now in college, and she's uh, done three films already. And she's um, actually going to be studying in Bologna next year through Brown, and um, I made sure that when she went to college that she didn't take any acting courses. Uh, I said, you know, you're already acting, you should learn, you know, you should take philosophy and religion and all the other things that you won't have a chance to be exposed to. And, uh, you know, the rest of it you can figure out. And what's your approach to technique as such? I mean, did you, you're learning of 
as you went along on, on sets, but what did, did, was there anyone in particular who sort of gave you great tips and guidance? Um, honestly, I think that it's a question of being able to focus and figuring out what works best for you. There's obviously a big difference between working in film and on stage. There's a certain amount of technique that's involved, but I think the most, the most valuable thing is to find your own voice as a director, as a filmmaker, as an actor, is to figure out what you'd have that nobody else has and to focus on that and not to let anyone else take that away from you. You know, I, um, I considered myself a character actor and not an ingenue, and I think that that really gave me the opportunity to have a base that was much broader than most of the really beautiful young women that came into the business when I came in. There are very few of us left. I think maybe Mia Farrow, Barbara Hershey, but when you think of the scores of people that start out um, at 20 and who's left, you know, by the time they even get to be 30, um, it's a very brutal business. And if you don't find a way to mature, I mean, in a way it's easier if you come in at 27 after graduate school because you're already a leading actor. But I think the first, um, you know, at least, 10 years, you're allowed to make as many mistakes as possible and make a lot of really good mistakes and to just keep working. I, I think that in the United States, sometimes there's a um, an approach that says that you have to choose things according to a plan of how your career will blossom and what the right thing to do is in different circumstances. Um, I'm here because all my plans failed. <laughs> um, I'm here because I'm, I was able to improvise. I took years off to have children. I did everything wrong, everything wrong. So um, I played mothers when you shouldn't have. I, you know, I, so I think that what you have to do is just listen to your heart and try to find as many different kinds of people, things that will teach you. Uh, I still don't mind taking supporting roles um, if they're good parts. Uh, I think that... Uh, Working with English actors um, taught me that, uh, you know, as an actor, you're supposed to keep working and um, experimenting and trying things that scare you and not feeling that you're too good for TV or that you shouldn't do a small part or maybe you shouldn't do this because it's too different or you don't know how it's going to turn out. For me, those are the interesting um, roles, the ones that you don't know how it's going to turn out. And working with new directors, for instance, is very exciting to me. I mean, just recently you've done <coughs> lower budget films like Igby Goes Down, but you also have done the big mainstream films. I mean, how do you kind of, um, what is the experience mm -hmm. like? Do you, mm -hmm. do you feel you find yourself sort of giving a little support, a little guidance maybe to young directors who are starting out, or do you just sort of accept them as who they um, are? You know, the, somebody who's been trying to get a film done for seven years probably stands a better chance of making a really exciting film. It's the second film that might be a problem, <laughs> not the first film. So I, I try to work with directors who have a passion about what they're going to do. I always ask somebody, why are you making this film? I want to be in a film that there's something to talk about in a press junket for five days. You know, if you can't mm -hmm. figure out how to you know, what you're going to talk about all that time, then you really shouldn't do the film. Um, I have to be able to explain to my kids why I'm going to disrupt their lives for a month or so, so that's important. Um, and I, I remember when I did Bull Durham and um, Ron Shelton, you know, was a first-time director and he'd been trying to get that film made. And it was an impeccable script. It was, I, I still to this day, one of the best scripts I've ever gotten that was just perfect when you, when you read it. And I said, you know, don't, you don't have to, add, you know, we don't have to talk about what Beatles she liked in high school. Just tell me faster, slower, let's do it. You know, it really, I can motivate anything. Um, I don't need to, you know, let's just figure out what is going to make the scene work. And I think that um, for me, you know, sometimes people either get lost in the technical aspects and, you know, they're having problems making the dolly shot and then they try to explain some bullshit psychological reason why you should walk more to the left, you know. <laughs> it really doesn't work with me. Um, I'd much prefer you just to say, I'm having problems with the dolly, could you just help us out here? And I'll be sure, you know. 
how about if I pick this up and have to take it over there? So, um, you know, I've been with really great directors in, in their first mediocre film, and I've been with first-time directors in their really great film. So I don't think it has anything to do with your experience. I think it has to do with um, the team that you assemble, how you cast it, uh, being protected by your producer. Um, and then, of course, once you get this little gem and you hand it over to the people that are going to market it and then tell you what your film is, um, you know, you have to be pretty lucky in that aspect, too, because um, there are a lot of films that just get completely lost even before they're going to be distributed. Mm. Do you watch yourself on set? Do you look at playback to sort of check the performance? I don't like to watch um, myself even in a finished film. Really? Um, because I've yet to ever do a film that I thought was really my performance was completely right. I think that's what's um, that's what's kind of addictive about it is that you feel you never get it right. You know, you see something and maybe you were on the right track, but you didn't, you weren't courageous enough to completely commit to it, or you look at it and you think, you know, why did they choose that? It was the lamest of all the takes, what, you know? So I find it um, pretty disconcerting. I like to be in films that I'm not in a lot of the films so that I can enjoy the most of the film. <laughs> when I see things that I, I wasn't in, then it's always a nice surprise to watch that part of the film that you weren't present for. Um, and, uh, but I, I can't say it takes me a few, a few, um, screenings before I'm not going, oh, wait a minute, what happened to that little piece that was there? And, and mm -hmm. was that, oh, oh, you know, I, 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 if I'd only known that. But when I look at myself, I think sometimes during filming, if you have to watch it for a technical reason, mm -hmm. um, then, uh, uh, that's understandable, but sometimes it makes me feel outside the character, and especially if you've made a choice to look, you know, awful, <laughs> and then you see it. I'm not sure I'd be brave enough the next day to come back and look awful. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd rather not see just how, you know, bitchy she is from the outside. I'd rather feel justified from the inside. <laughs> um, so lots of times I... I and I remember when I was working with Billy Wilder, he was very, very um, insulted because he insists that everybody goes to dailies in the middle of the day. And he did very little coverage. So it was practically like watching a film edited together. And um, he every day he would get so angry with me because I, I wouldn't go. And about choosing parts as well, I mean, you're very well known as an activist. You know, you're very active for UNICEF and for many, for many causes as a spokesperson. How does that kind of intersect with your choosing of roles? Do you particularly like to work with you know, films that you feel have a, a social... I mean, you do mainstream films that are just entertainment, like Stepmom, but mm -hmm. you also do films like Dead Man Walking was a particularly passionate project of yours as well. That is well, Dead Man Walking for me was a love story set in a milieu that had to do with a social issue, and I'm, I gravitate towards people reaching out to each other because I think it's just about the bravest thing you can possibly do, whether it's to an 11-year-old boy like in The Client or whether or not it's to a, someone on death row. Um, I, when, when I met Sister Helen and I got the book, I was interested in Dead Man Walking as, a, as a, a story about love and unconditional love that really was about whether or not unconditional love is possible between anything other than a mother and child. Um, I personally believe that every film is political, that every film t tells you, The Passion of Christ had a very strong political message. Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies have very strong political messages, but they, uh, they underline and, and um, all these, uh, the sexism, the, the ageism, the racism, the systemic uh, isms that are in our society, they reinforce those. The, the, the films that are called political are films that challenge the status quo. But really every film, when you see 
the effect that Dead Man Walking had to start a dialogue about that issue. You wonder what all the rest of the films are doing to our kids and everything else that sit there and watch these films and tell them what it means to be a man and, and how to solve problems and what women want. And all of these things are completely reinforced time and time again. But um, the ones that they call political are just the ones that in some way question what we already accept as uh, true, uh, systems of justice, whatever. Um, I think it's a way of um, making it harder to sell these films. I think it's a way of narrowing and containing the audience and the message. I mean, it was quite a miracle that Dead Man Walking crossed over into the mainstream, and that is because um, so many mainstream um, talk shows and things uh, championed it. And because there was something, some element in that film about redemption that talked to people, um, but I, I really think that as a, as a person who makes a film or participates in film in any way, you have to be responsible for the images that you're putting out there because maybe I just have an overblown sense of their power, but I think they do affect people. And um, so, for instance, if someone gives me a film that... Um, <coughs> um, I, I, at one point I had a, a film given to me that was about a white woman who was trying to adopt a black baby and which was, is a very big issue in the United States and um, every person of color in the movie was either crazy um, a dope uh, addict of some kind or a radical lawyer um, and when they gave me the script, they weren't clear on who would get the baby, me or the birth mother. And I said, well, how could I possibly say yes to this project without knowing who gets the baby and why? And have you shown this script to anyone that are in, any people that are involved in these issues? And um, they hadn't. And they said, well, you know, if you don't like the ending, we'll reshoot it. No, I've been in the business long enough to know that was ridiculous. Um, so, for instance, that movie, when it came out, you know, really had a message, and it wasn't necessarily a message that I felt I could be part of. Um, if there's a movie that has a really strong link with making violence against women sexy, I think that's probably more dangerous than I would like to be part of. Um, but I didn't find Pretty Baby, for instance, offensive. And um, I got in trouble for that because as a feminist, I was playing a hooker. But my answer to that was that at the this woman goes back for her children. She does it in a way. The only means that she has at that time, which is to uh, be a prostitute, and that I stood behind it. And I felt that the reason that that film was so um, disturbing to people was because the only person in the film that didn't seem a victim was the child. She was by heads far above everybody else in the <laughs> film. Everyone else was so pathetic and she was so strong and so clear and so completely in control. And I think that's the reason that people got really upset. Um, so I think that it's, you have to respect um, the power of film and I think you have to ask those questions as an actor, a director, or anybody that's involved in a film. If the film that you're putting out there, you know, what finally is it saying? What, what uh, I mean, is it saying that if you don't kill an unarmed person at, at you know, one on one in a war, that that person then goes off and kills your entire platoon? So as a man, you have to make sure that even unarmed people are killed. You know, is that the message that you want to say about war? Um, do you want to glorify it or do you want to show just how horrible war is, how, how monstrous it is to the people that are being asked to fight it? You know, um, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's okay. beautifully. That's excellent. Bonjour, uh, Léo. Bonjour. On assiste euh, actuellement, euh, sous couleur de, de lutter contre l'abjection du terrorisme, sous la houlette de George Bush, 
à la mise en place de politiques sécuritaires et même au développement de ces politiques sécuritaires qui affectent les démocraties, qui affectent la liberté des personnes. Et ce déni des droits des personnes est illustré notamment par Guantanamo. Et ma question, c'est vous qui êtes très engagé sur la question des droits humains, où en est la mobilisation des artistes, des comédiens, des cinéastes par rapport à Guantanamo um, There's a climate of um, serious fear in the United States among um, actors, writers, directors. It was very clear in the lead up to the war that um, to become outspoken Uh, you were either with us or against us, meaning that, for instance, my picture and name was put on the front of newspapers with bin Laden as a bin Laden lover um, for questioning the buildup to the war. At this time, it was made quite clear that to question anything, uh, though I think it would be difficult to deny employment to actors. The fear of isolation um, and ridicule and uh, the intense um, asking for uh, violence by the hate jocks, the hate radio people that happened, you know, the life, the th threats to your life, whatever, um, made it very difficult for a lot of uh, people who in their hearts wanted to say something. Um, the corporations that control all the venues for singers, for instance, so that, you know, Clear Channel, which is a religious right radio station, but owns almost all of the places that um, uh, acts would perform, made it difficult for singers to speak out. Um, so I can't say that there's, uh, it's, not, it's not very easy to mobilize anybody in the entertainment business. Um, the, the press, is corporate owned for the most part. And that makes it difficult because there are no alternative voices. For instance, they would ask me to come on CNN, but they wouldn't allow me to bring an expert or uh, um, uh, uh, you know, someone who was an expert on Iraq or someone who had been an arms inspector or some of the people that I was talking to. They, wouldn't, they didn't want them on, they just wanted me on, and then they would take you out of context and it would be a disaster. So um, I think that there are, I, I get my hope from the fact that there are so many grassroots um, organizations that I work with that have been, that are still plugging away. In terms of Guantanamo, the Center for Constitutional Rights has been, um, representing a lot of individuals who ha have been incarcerated for two years and have not been charged with anything, for instance, and they are quietly getting them out of um, jail. Um, there certainly is a movement to close Guantanamo, but then as soon as that movement happened, um, uh, the national security thing, you know, p makes people so frightened that, uh, I think the, the real question is why so many people are willing to hand over their fate, are willing to delude themselves, and why all of this information that comes up from time to time about Cheney or Rumsfeld or, or Karl Rove at the moment only plays in the newspaper and for a, a very small amount of time and then it just disappears. So it makes it very difficult to get anything of any consequence going. Um, and when people are frightened, I mean, there are so many quotes from, you know, pre-Nazi Germany that you know the minute that you um, the minute that you frighten someone, they're willing to hand over their personal freedoms. And I think this is a country that is 
has been governed by fear and misinformation. And most people in the United States don't have information. Now, I suppose the question is why they don't feel they need to get more information. But um, I don't have the answer to that. And I know that there are many more people than it seems who, because you don't see it in the press, who are working towards trying to preserve our freedoms, who are, and thank God for the internet, because a lot of the pieces that people write and a lot of the really interesting minds can be found on the internet that are writing things at different websites. And also, you know, the truth about the war and the truth about various things that are going on, um, you can still find in the internet. So as long as we have the internet, maybe people will be able to find information, I hope. In that context, just to ask a follow-up question myself, in that context, you know, given the kind of obsession of celebrity and given what you just said about CNN's strategy of trying to get you, in, rather, do you feel a sort of duty as a public figure to raise these issues to campaigns? I think because um, we have access to information that other people don't, I, I do feel it's, it's not just my responsibility, but it's, you, you know, I, I, you feel so overwhelmed and so um, hopeless and so crazy when you know something and, the, and it's not getting out there and you hope that you can try to combat some of the misinformation by at least giving people a chance to hear something else and then letting them make up their own minds. So I think that um, it is the duty of every American if they have information, but certainly if you're media connected, um, you have a little bit more chance of, of getting cameras to an issue where they normally don't go. When I For the UN, when I was in um, Africa years ago, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, I went there because nobody was talking about the AIDS crisis there. It took years and years and years. And I remember there was a German um, jo documentary, and at the very end, after spending you know a week or 10 days there and, and in very difficult circumstances, they started attack and they'd been with me the whole time, and they started attacking me because I had stayed in hotels and not in um, tents, or I don't know where they thought. I was staying in the same hotels they were staying in, but... Um, <laughs> and I and I said, you know, after all this time, you know, you're asking me about that. You know, why don't you ask yourself why you weren't here two years ago, three years ago, four years ago? Why did you wait for me to get here before you came to do this story? And I think that's more the point. Celebrities don't want to have to be traveling all over the place and leaving their families. They're, we're not experts on anything, but the problem is that the press doesn't go, especially if you're talking about problems that involve people of color who most of the white media think are dispensable, mm. then those questions, those people, um, lives just are not newsworthy to most people who are making the decisions. And so the only way to get coverage on some of these issues is to get Angelina Jolie to go to Darfur, you know? I mean, that's the way it works. That's not we, we don't like that, and that's, you know, the minute the press starts to do their job more thoroughly, I'll be happy to stay home. We asked yesterday um, to uh, Abbas uh, Karostami uh, on the idea of political involvement in his own country, and uh, he said that somehow we, we have to adapt. He cannot do it because we can understand the fear he can have uh, and this is related with what you said. When I don't believe uh, you when you talk about this idea of fear, uh, because I think it's a political concept only. And in fact, you live in a uh, free country, I believe. And uh, uh, people should maybe uh, take their responsibility. But sometimes I think they fail, like the Ralph Nader case during the 2000 uh, election. So my question is, uh, to what extent uh, should an artist, uh, an actor, uh, take position uh, on political issues? Thank you. Well, I think that you know the first thing, uh, first way that an artist can take, uh, can move from what an artist does into the political arena is to be informed. And secondly of all, you don't have to take to the streets to be able to affect change. You can make a film, you can 
you, you know, I mean, that's the, the best way is if, you know, when Jonathan Demme did Philadelphia, it was the first time that uh, a person with AIDS had been humanized in it. And at that point, that film did a lot to start a dialogue. So, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes it's much, if you're trying to reach people that don't have um, knowledge or are uneducated about an issue or who are very closed off about an issue because they're afraid to be, uh, to have information, then the best way to do it is to, uh, is a more subtle way through the arts. Um, I feel that, y y you know, to say that an artist doesn't have the right to be political after you elect a president that was an actor or a governor, and both very bad actors, by the way. <laughs> um, we do live in a free country. We live in a wonderful country. I love America, and it is free, ostensibly. The feeling of being separated from the crowd, the feeling of being ostracized, the, the you know columns being written about your children, your kids picking up the paper and seeing terrible things about you are, is very hurtful. It's um, when you see that Sean Penn and Tim Robbins both got Oscars, obviously all the campaigns, and there were campaigns calling into the studios, asking for people not to hire George Clooney, asking for people not to hire me. I have to explain to my children every time I'm arrested. I have to explain to my children why their names are in the paper. I have to explain to them. But that's a hard thing to put your family in jeopardy, you know? And it's, it's not like it was in the United States when people were trying to form unions and you were shot. Or it, it, it isn't the same as being in Iraq and being an activist or Afghanistan and being a woman trying to run for an office. It, you can't compare the two. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't pretend that I'm incredibly brave, but I can see, I, I understand why people are hesitant. There's, in the United States, celebrities. I also understand why People are frightened in the United States to be separated like that. And, and also there's an overwhelming sense that it won't make any difference. And that's, that's the thing that really is the most horrible, that if you're going to make a stand, it's not going to count for anything anyway, so why bother? Because there are a lot of people who are political activists right now are very disillusioned. Um, when millions and millions of people took to the streets and the government doesn't listen, if you're in England, if you're in Italy, if you're wherever, you know, that's very upsetting. I think that, you know, the G8 accomplished a lot. You can get people involved. I don't think anybody knew what was going on in Africa with the, or with the G8, but before all those rock stars got out there and had that concert and people started asking questions. Unfortunately, people, you know, the kids in the United States didn't know that leaders were getting together. I don't think they knew. You know, now at least they know, and if they're going to turn their backs on it, you, they, it's not out of ignorance, and so that's a difference. And I think that in, in those ways, you can make a difference, but I think that it's, um, you know, why are people afraid? Because as a celebrity, you're so dependent on uh, the media and you're so dependent on being hired and you, you know, it's a collaborative thing. Dead Man Walking, which is one of the most touching films I've ever seen. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know to which point that raised the issue in the United States about death penalty and if that generated a, a social movement against it. Dead Man Walking was the first time that anybody had humanized either side of that debate. Uh, the death penalty is like abortion. People have very strong opinions without being informed about what, what the choices are, what it involves. Um, Sister Helen's book uh, did a really good job of balancing the debate, but giving the specifics of what it means to kill someone in a premeditated way and how, um, and, and when we were doing it, one of the things I loved about her was that she didn't, she just kind of backed into it. She didn't go in as a hero, you know, she didn't know what she was doing. And so that I found to be interesting. Um, what happened with Dead Man Walking was that suddenly people could discuss the issue in an informed way, in a real way. And um, then when Sister Helen, well, first of all, the book is, I don't know, in 12 languages now. When she goes to speak, she talks to thousands and thousands of people instead of 100 people. Um, it was also a, a healing mechanism for the families of people who had been executed, but also the families of the victims for reconciliation. 
um, they found it uh, a, 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 you know, a nice beginning to have a dialogue about that. And so it did an enormous good. They showed it to lawyers, judges, uh, the Pope. The Pope rewrote his stand on the death penalty after Sister Helen brought him the film. The debate about the death penalty goes to the very crux of use of violence to, uh, to fix situations that are very complex. It goes to the very heart of how unjust uh, we are in terms of the po poor and incarcerated. Um, um, I recently did another version of something connected to the death penalty, which is called The Exonerated, which is the story of a um, people who were eventually exonerated had been held um, unfairly for years and years on death row. That was a is a play, and then we did a TV thing. And I think the more people here have a face they can put on the death penalty and, and, and the question of the victims and the victims that are on the other side, um, then the debate can really be uh, a more educated debate. And most people, if they know someone will uh, be held without the possibility of parole, well, do not want to take the responsibility for killing someone. And um, you see, even in Oklahoma City, when Sister Helen was there, hundreds of thousands of people signed on to a, um, an anti-death penalty petition. So, um, you know, for me, uh, I, I always knew intellectually that the death penalty didn't make sense because it was too expensive and it didn't really work and all of these things. But when someone would say, well, what about if a child of yours was killed, what would you do then? And I you know, now know the answer to those questions because now I viscerally understand that the death penalty doesn't work. Um, and, it, and, and because I have children, it doesn't make sense to tell them that you can kill in certain circumstances but not in others. <laughs> Per una persona avere um, degli impegni così sociali e eh, politici, essendo a Hollywood, ehm, e più essendo una donna, se è ancora più difficile magari entrare comunque nel uh, movie business. <ride> e la seconda domanda, lei ha sempre fatto dei film con uh, un grande messaggio, dei grandi messaggi politici o sociali o uh, a livello di persone proprio. Volevo chiederle se crede anche nel cinema fine a se stesso, um, un film per essere solo un film, oppure so se un film deve per forza avere un messaggio politico, sociale. Thank you. Um, first of all, I don't live in Hollywood, I live in New York. Um, uh, secondly of all, you know, I mean, they need women in film some point <laughs> so it's not so difficult to get in a film I think it's difficult for women to survive in the business for a long period of time because it's still a white heterosexually male dominated industry and um, sometimes the stories that they're interested in telling are a bit lopsided and so uh, I think that the answer is just to ask uh, and now more women are, are more actors that are women are making more films and if everybody, if you pick up the newspaper every day, you know, the drama is not all about 22 year old girls and 45 year old men. There's a lot of stories that involve all kinds of people and I think the important thing is for studio executives to green light projects which, which people feel very strongly about making instead of businessmen making decisions on posters that they think will sell. Um, a lot of films get green lighted before there's even a script on some kind of idea that the marketing department has. And a lot of films that are very good films get watered down by the executives because they think that then, therefore they will appeal to a larger audience when in fact the films that are eccentric and very specific very often make like you know uh, make much more money when they're not going after a broader uh, audience. Um, I think I answered the question about 
uh, that I think all films are political. Um, I don't think, I think that films should be entertaining and that they should challenge your perspective and that makes them political. I don't think if you set out to make a humorless film that doesn't grab you, that doesn't have a hook, I don't, that's not good storytelling as far as I'm concerned. I think that filmmakers have to be storytellers. They have to give, make good stories. But you see a film like No Man's Land, for instance, which is an excellent film, and it's funny, and it's horrible, and it's true. It's real, you know, it's, it's something that you've never seen before. Now certainly, that's a political film. Um, even, uh, for instance, Eddie Murphy's The Nutty Professor, I think is a political film. You know, by the end of that film, you want that guy to stay fat. How did they do that? You know, how do they define what makes a man attractive and, and, and make you very uncomfortable with this idea of making fun of people's weight? That's political. And that's an entertaining film, and that's a well-made film. So I think that any film that tells a story and challenges your perspective, and when you leave that movie theater, you see things slightly differently. I remember leaving the cinema after seeing Wings of Desire. You know, I was seeing everything completely differently. That's what films should do. And they should entertain, and they should amuse, and they should challenge your perspective. And, and any film that does that is political. Okay. Um, hello, I'm a Swiss, young Swiss actress, oh. and, um, and it's very nice what you said. Thank you so much. Thank you. And maybe there's, I thought maybe there's advice, maybe someone you, you would have known when you started in this job. And I'm really interested in, because you said you make theater, and I, I'm just at the point just to decide. Um, I, I make a lot of theater, and, and it's getting a problem with film. And I'm really interested what you think of these two different kind of ways of our profession. Well, I think that, um, I think that theater, uh, though obviously it's not as high profile as film or television, um, for me, theater is more satisfying because, and I say this because none of my children are present because the last time I said it when my children were present, they got very embarrassed. But the difference to me between Theater and film is the difference between making love and masturbation. <laughs> um, in theater, you actually have a relationship with someone, for better or worse, when you're in the theater. You know what the audience is seeing. You take responsibility for their reaction. But you get an immediate, something's coming back. You actually have a relationship. In film, you just have to get a little moment right practically by yourself. So. Uh, you know, it's a completely different skill um, involved in film and, and theater. I love film because it's, you know, it's like, it's like going west with the wagons. You know, you get a group of people and they have this idea and they have a goal that's somewhere and they circle their honey wagons and they, you know, everybody does what they have to do, especially when you're on a low budget film and you're, or you're on location. And, and, you know, I love the family and the collaboration that uh, film evokes. Um, and then you see the film and you think, I wonder whose vision that was, you know, I thought we were all going there and instead we're over here. Um, so you have to do film, I think for the journey of it, you can't hold your breath and see the way it turns out. Um, but I, you know, I love both of the process. Obviously, you know, film gets much more attention usually. Um, and, I, and I think that as an, as an actor, you should be able to do everything. Um, I think that um, if theater especially builds your confidence as an actor, then that's a really, really a valuable experience because if you ever get to do film, then you'll have more of a sense of who you are. And it's hard to come into a film for just a short period of time. It always takes me you know, a week or so to get over. I'm always terrified when I start anything. And so my kids the other day said to me, yeah, but mom, you're only working for two weeks on that film. So you're gonna have a hard time. And sometimes that's true, you know, to go in for a short period of time, sometimes it's much more difficult. Um, but I think you learn skills from both. And the most important and most difficult thing is to just be present. What I love about theater is that even when something works one night, you can't count on it. The minute you start to count on it happening the next night, it doesn't. 
So you have to, it's a good way to remember how to be in your life, you know, that you really have to listen, that you have to not worry about if something's right or wrong, but just if it works. That you shouldn't be judging whether or not it's the right solution or not. And, and I love working most with directors that I have confidence in because it allows me to make mistakes 100%. If I have to be watching myself and directing myself, then I'm never free to completely mess up, you know. And for me, uh, even when you feel like you're taking it into a very extreme area, it's usually not that extreme, really. And so, um, you know, working with John Turturro, who's an actor, is great because he's also a good director. Working with... Um, Actors doesn't necessarily mean that they're good directors, and working with directors doesn't necessarily mean that they don't understand actors at all. But I would prefer to work with a director who I know has all the structure in place and really knows what he's doing. You know, you'd never call Ridley Scott um, an actor's director, but he, because he's not going to ask you the questions. He assumes you're doing your part of the job, and it was up to Gina and I to figure out a lot of that stuff. But when we did and we asked him for what we needed, he was there to give it to us. But he, if we hadn't been put in such a heroic vista, if he hadn't been so in charge of everything on Thelma and Louise, those characters wouldn't have had the, the magnitude that they had. because It was because of the way he shot it that that film worked on such an amazing, it became so significant, you know. Um, but it was up to us to figure out the the moment to moment stuff and what accent we were using and, you know, where the trip was from. And so I think, um, you know, the collaboration on film, every time you start a film, it's a different language that you have to learn with the specific people that you're working with. And on stage, it's very much about, it's closer to real life because you have to give and take and you have to be aware of where the focus is so that you're not stealing focus and things like that. But the fact that you get so much from an audience, I think, is really thrilling and scary, really scary. Um, remembering your performance in uh, uh, Alfie, uh, you were very maternal, very, very sexy and very um, vindicative. Is this uh, uh, the new Louise? I mean, <laughs> okay. a woman chosen as object who chooses uh, her objects, men as objects. Oh, I hope he wasn't an object. He was so such a good kisser. I didn't think of him really as an object. <laughs> um, I think she just, uh, I, I don't know that she objectifies him. I think that she has defined her life in a way that she doesn't apologize for, and I really like that uh, about her. She's um, independent financially, which helps a lot. And I think she really cares about him. I think she made a mistake. You know, she was tempted and she just made a mistake. And in my fantasy, I hope that they can find a way to, you know, continue to have fun together. I think she's unapologetic. I, I don't know that she needs him to complete her life, but I think she truly cares about him and I think that you know if she could have gotten away with it without having to lie that would have been the best thing but um, then you wouldn't have had that you know he needed his moral comeuppance I guess and so it was my job to to give it to him um, but I you know I I, I think that's part of um, women becoming liberated is that they can make the same stupid mistakes men make. <laughs> Please give a big round of applause. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sarandon. Thank you.